So uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today um, and to be here to share some of the stories that the LLR has been party to, which wouldn't have been possible without all your work to raise the valuable funds and support. So thank you. So I'm a clinician and I treat acute myeloid leukemia. And today the talk is really going to be, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking if I was a patient in my clinic, what would I want to know? about acute myeloid leukemia. So I'm not going to blind you with science and all the rest of it, but I'm going to tell you what I tell patients when they come and see me. We run a research group also in the University of Oxford, which has really generous funding from the LLR. And I'll allude to some of it, but it won't be the major focus of what I'm going to say today. OK. So as Chris Bunce, Chris B, has alluded to, uh, acute myeloid leukemia has been one of the diseases that's been much harder to get improvements in survival over. And Peter Campbell, earlier this morning, talked about the genetics, and he showed you that it's complicated. There are many genes involved. And this disease affects around 2,200 patients a year in the United Kingdom. And it's one of the more it's the most common aggressive leukemia that we see or anybody else sees in the Western world. The prognosis in those individuals who are under the age of 60 is relatively good. I mean, when I first started um, being a hematology doctor, I remember it so well. This was back in the 80s. And at the time, I remember thinking, and it's, it, it may seem slightly shocking, I remember thinking, if I ever got in, I'm not sure I'd want treatment. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, the survival was around 20% for young people, and the treatment was toxic. In 2010, the survival is better. It's around 50%. But most patients are over 65 years old. And this is the age group where we've really got to make a difference now. And for them, survival, sadly, is only 5%. So we've got a lot to do. So you might ask me, why have we not made more progress? Well, Peter this morning told you that we have made a lot of progress, understanding the biology of the disease. And that's really only come on in the last, I would say, five to eight years. And now, AML is one of the best understood blood cancers at a scientific level. And this knowledge is absolutely crucial to develop new therapy. And it'll be the new therapy, which I'm going to talk about later, this knowledge with the new therapy that's going to be crucial to improve survival and quality of life, because we need to find medicines that work for patients who are older. So what do we know scientifically about AML? Well, when I started in the 1980s, AML was considered one disease, one round block. And these were the leukemic cells, and we'd look at it under a microscope, and we'd say, this person had AML. The genetics came through really in the 80s to the 2010. And now this one block has been cut up into lots of little pies, each with a different genetic complement of mutations. But what Peter has told you about today is that actually it's even more complicated than that. And what I want to show you in this slide is if you consider that each column, and there are 300 columns here, is a sample of leukemia for one patient. And on the, each row is a different kind of genetic abnormality, you will see that virtually every patient is different. So it's not just the number of mutations, but it's the way the mutations are organized amongst each other. Virtually everybody is going to be unique. So AML is not one disease. So what does this mean for patients in the United Kingdom today? Well, the first thing is we've got to have reliable, modern genetic tests for all patients. And the one thing the NHS must do, NHS England, maybe different in Scotland, we've got to have a unified strategy to deliver these tests to all hospitals. And this will need all of us to work together, including the LLR and the advocacy that the LLR can bring to it. We can't treat all AML patients in the same way. And this raises a question that sometimes is asked, but surely we don't treat patients in the same way, do we? Well, we don't, but our boxes of treatment are rather broad. 
So there is a group of patients, the younger patients usually, or the fitter, older patients, who have intensive treatment, and there are lots of different chemotherapy regimes. And we have a probably the best clinical trial structure in the United Kingdom in the world. It's the biggest in the world. And we should really take advantage of this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical trials in a minute. We also have, for the first time, a really good antibody. It's a very powerful tool, and it's coming into clinical trials now. And for some patients, they're going to need a stem cell transplant because chemotherapy isn't going to be enough. And the Anthony Nolan has done a great job publicizing uh, donor collection and getting people enrolled into donor registries, and it's a really good thing. Most patients, however, who are older, will not be fit enough for these programs of therapy. And in the non-intensive box, we still don't have proven effective drugs. And that's where a lot of effort has to be put in. So we need new, effective, affordable drugs. So what are the new drugs for treating AML? Well, there are a large number. I'm not going to go through the list. And one drug that Peter alluded to earlier that was actually presented at a conference in America about a month ago is absolutely stellar. They treated, it's a very early phase one trial, 10 patients treated, in, in, and in these early trials, it's usually around safety, five of the 10 went into complete remission, and these were refractory patients to all other therapy. So there are new drugs coming on the horizon. I'm gonna talk about one other new drug at the end of the talk. So this is good. First time in a long time, we have more drugs than we know how to test quickly enough. But there are challenges here. And the first challenge is the drugs have to come from the United Kingdom. So most drugs, as you know, are owned by drug companies. And most drugs are first tested in the United States because it's a bigger market. But we have to create an environment in the UK where drug companies want to come here to test their drugs first. So the UK must have the best clinical trial environment in the world. And I think the LLR really needs to be congratulated for the TAP, the Therapy Acceleration Program, that they've put in place, which has a real focus to get early stage drugs into the clinic. And Jeff Thomas has been a real pioneer here. And he came with this vision uh, some time ago, and he's worked really well with the LLR on that. The other challenge is, is how do we test drugs efficiently so if there are many different drugs and there are many different types of AML, I've told you, patients are all different. How do we match the right drug for the right patient? And how do we do it efficiently? Who is going to respond to what? That's the question. And this is where the center of this must be trials. So when I talk to patients in clinic, a common perception is that if you're going to be in a trial, you're a guinea pig. And that really isn't the case. The case is that we have to learn from every patient we treat, and every patient must teach us about the side effects of the drugs they're having. We have to be in a learning culture. And trials are the center of that learning culture. So we now have rationally designed drugs. Peter's told you that there are genetic tests coming through that may predict the drugs to use right at the beginning, which drugs are going to work better for which patient right at the outset. And Christine has told you that we can now look at how much leukemia is left behind when a patient is on treatment. And you can then, if they're not doing so well, intensify treatment or change treatment. And if they're doing really well, you might be able to just pull back a little bit. So this is about dosing and drug selection. So we now have genetic tests where we can use the latest predictive tests throughout treatment to measure what we call residual disease. And therefore, with this kind of environment and with the NHS, it has many faults, we all know that, but one of the things it does have is it provides a single point of entry for clinical trials and for people to do clinical work. In the United States and throughout Europe, each institution competes with each other, and that's a real problem. So we must use the benefits of the NHS. What about cost, you might say? How will the NHS ever afford all these new drugs so the first thing is we have to inform and lobby. And this is why I was delighted to hear the talk from Public Affairs. The Cancer Drugs Fund has been transformational for patients. And we need to make sure that we work with NICE to make sure that the uh, uh, edicts of NICE uh, really work for patient benefit. But 
actually, nice is not all bad. Some of the drug companies have had to reduce their prices, and that's not a bad thing. I think the other thing we've got to do, really, is we've got to encourage our universities to develop new drugs. And there's a lot of research going on, and it's been very difficult to translate that into actually making medicines. And one of the things we've done in Oxford is to partner up with Stanford University. And over the last five years, with significant government money, some 35 million pounds, we've developed what we think is a really interesting new therapy, which we're going to start, a first-in-man, first-in-class set of trials in the United Kingdom, which I hope the LLR will be part of or may want to be part of, which uh, we're really excited about. So I think we need to think about the therapeutic space within the academic environment. So there is lots to do, but I don't think there's been a better time to do it. And so I'd all encourage you to walk away from this presentation with that in mind. I think all of this actually relies on one other thing, which is why it's really important to have Kirsty come today. It's all very well for doctors to you know, stand up and say things, but the thing that really makes a difference to a patient's care is the nursing care they get. And it's a real pleasure and privilege for me to have Kirsty come and talk to you about that. So thank you.